and welcome to Dialogue. Figures from China's five-day Labor Day holiday show a strong recovery in the tourism sector and consumer markets, helping to inject fresh growth into the revival of the nation's economy after COVID. China's Ministry of Culture and Tourism said some uh, 274 million trips were made nationwide during the holiday, a year-on-year -year increase of nearly 71 percent, surpassing the 2019 Labor Day holiday. What does the strong growth in tourism mean to the overall economic expansion? And what are the challenges ahead for China's economy? To discuss these issues and more, I'm glad to be joined today by Rick Dunham, visiting scholar at Tsinghua University, Chu Qiang, research fellow of Beijing Foreign Studies University, Hong Hao, chief economist of Grow Investment Group, and Miguel Girachi, a professor of finance in Nottingham University, Ningbo, and former Under Secretary of State of Ministry of Economic Development of Italy. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingdu. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, so, Hong Hao, you know, we have this number of uh, 274 million domestic trips in five day holiday. Uh, that figure represents, you know, 119 percent of pre pandemic levels in 2019. Uh, so, what do you make of this number? Are you surprised, or is this number uh, simply as expected? Mm, I think it's substantially uh, higher than what people were looking for uh, before the holiday. I mean, obviously, uh, people were looking for a very strong holiday sales uh, uh, in this uh, Golden Week holiday, but you know, but we didn't expect that you know the uh, number would be such huge number. It's actually 120 percent above uh, uh, the 2019 level, right? So uh, that was a normal year. So you know, in this year, one uh, six months after the recovery and reopen. Uh, you know, we, we actually have like 1.2 times uh, people on the road traveling. So even though the uh, per capita spend is about 10% less than uh, uh, 2019, and overall, I think, you know, the uh, tourism sales growth is, is still up, you know, about 1% year, uh, uh, compared to four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Chu Qiang, uh, you're nodding your head. Uh, so you do agree this number is probably uh, more than, uh, I mean, expected? Oh, yes. Uh, it's within the expectation and more than expectation because we witnessed a similar uh, you know, pattern in other countries, for example, in Singapore or in the Hong Kong region uh, or in uh, Western uh, you know, Europe. We've been seeing the, when they reopened from the pandemic and they have the revenge of spending on many things, services, tourism. That's a normal expectation. But the number of China actually is beyond that. It's so hot. You go everywhere. You see people, mountain people, this is the old Chinese saying. You see, there's so many people, so crowded. So people does have this kind of uh, you know, enthusiasm to spend the money and enjoy their life. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick, you know, I wonder uh, what does this uh, these numbers say about uh, you know the consumption and the service sector, probably as well as the overall Chinese uh, economic performance. Well, it means number one, there was a lot of pent up demand uh, for travel. People really wanted to go places, and they. I mean, they had been putting it off. Uh, sometimes they couldn't have gone, and now they did. So I think that that's, that's one lesson. The second lesson is I think people are spending more money uh, on tourism, on experiences, uh, than they are on products right now. Uh, that I, I think people have a lot of things, and right now they want to experience things. And so I, I, I think that this is a real opportunity, and it's a continuing opportunity for growth in domestic tourism, I think, because this, this, is, this is evidence that there is demand there. Uh, it's a it surprise, as you heard, uh, some Chinese analysts. And, and, and so I, I think that uh, it, it, will, it will be a trend for the future, uh, that we're going to see growth in this area, and that probably the government will uh, focus more attention attention on trying to increase even more uh, domestic tourism over the over the next few years. Okay, uh, domestic tourism, so expected to uh, grow more in the future, but then of course, uh, uh, Chu Chiang, you know, uh, not everybody probably, uh, there, are, there are people who are concerned like uh, the sustainability of this um, uh, growth level, uh, you know, in terms of this pent up demand. Uh, as well as this uh, in the overall service sector or consumption uh, market. Uh, what's your expectation for the you know, following seven, eight months of this year? Oh, I think uh, this enthusiasm is going to continue, as just my colleague just uh, mentioned. People are going to spend more of the money in the services, in experience, 
people want to escape from the old paradigm. People want to go out and enjoy their life and to see what they have never seen before. And they've been working so hard before and they try to save money to buy houses and to buy a lot of expensive things for themselves. Now, after, you know, three years period, and they started the change of the thinking. So I think, yes, the enthusiasm, as my coworker has mentioned, will continue not only in the coming seven or eight months, probably it's going to be continuous one or two years. But on the other things, like they mentioned, on the products, uh, like on the assets, I think this kind of enthusiasm still need time to recover. Uh, well, in the Hong Kong, there is an issue, of course, you know, for economists, the P, you know, they are concerned about uh, you know, high saving rate in China. It remains at a high level. Uh, on, of course, you know, for the government, uh, they would love to see you know, people to spend more rather than to save more. Uh, do you think you see any change in that kind of a trend? You know, partly because of the COVID situation, uncertainty, so people save more for the rainy days. But now, uh, since the reopening, do you think people are ready to spend? Um, I think so. Well, last year, uh, the uh, savings in the uh, residential bank account uh, increased by 18 trillion yuan. It is the highest in history. And I think that is because, you know, in, in part because of the uh, pandemic and also in part, you know, because you know, people just didn't have excuses and, 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 and places to spend the money, right? So they, they put the money aside uh, for rainy days. But for the first three months of the year, you know, we're already seeing them uh, spending. For example, uh, in the first quarter, we're seeing, you know, retail sales growth is up, uh, you know, more than 10%, right? So it's one of the main driver for Chinese economic growth. And I think, you know, as, you know, time goes by and people getting used to, you know, the uh, life post-pandemic, you know, uh, and, and also, you know, after people start buying houses, then, you know, I'm pretty sure that they will have, you know, more reasons to spend uh, than the May Day holidays. Mm -hmm. uh, then Hong Ho, of course, there's a number, I guess, it's uh, the number uh, was made available before the May Day holiday. Uh, so it was not taking into consideration uh, of the uh, latest development. Uh, that number is like non-manufacturing purchasing uh, manager index. You know, mm -hmm. It slipped actually mm -hmm. from March, uh, you know, like 58.2 percent and then uh, 58.2 uh, and then, you know, in April, it slipped to 56.4, uh, basically like a two point lower. Uh, is that a cause to mm. concern? I am not concerned at all. Uh, March is, you know, I think March number is, you know, almost two year high, right? So you're bound to get a decrease from such a high level. And also, you know, well above 50, we're soon, still showing expansion, right? So the service industry is clearly expanding and also you know, if you look at the May Day figure and also the uh, retail sales growth figure that I mentioned just now, it collaborate, you know, with the, uh, the service PMI. So I wouldn't too con be too concerned about that, you know, as long as it's about 50, it's showing expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to also have uh, Rick's uh, assessment. Rick, you think this uh, consumption or this uh, service sector, uh, you mentioned about this uh, kind of a, like a pattern uh, will continue. Uh, do you have confidence that uh, you know people will spend more, and then uh, we will see a revival of the service sector, the consumption market? Well, uh, if current uh, conditions hold, I think that's the case. But I think the uncertainties right now uh, are what we have to uh, watch out for. I mean, think things that uh, could happen in the future could happen in the world. Uh, and will people be concerned about uh, a global recession uh, and then that hurting China? I mean, I think right now it's, the question is psychological and China has weathered the pandemic very well. Uh, and and, and uh, consumer confidence and demand are both good. Uh, the question is whether anything changes the trajectory that we've seen in the data this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, uh, Miguel on the line. Uh, welcome to the show, Miguel. So, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, issued a statement on the Chinese economy uh, at the end of the May Day holiday, saying that the easy part of China's post-reopening recovery, uh, which includes the full recovery of mobility and the release of a pent-up demand in select sectors, uh, such as tourism, is done. So the easy part is done. So what are the probably more challenging part uh, for the revival of the economy? We, I don't know if it's easily, if it's done, like Goldman Sachs says, I would disagree with them because let's not forget that in the second quarter of this year, 
we probably are going to have even higher growth than we had in the first quarter because we had a very low base in 2022 because that was the time when we had the lockdown in Shanghai and other parts. So the spring of 2022, we we know it's a, a weak base uh, from which to start. So uh, even if there are no new um, increase in input factors, uh, just uh, starting from a lower base uh, should uh, provide uh, growth in the second quarter. Uh, then, of course, uh, as we know, the Chinese economy is uh, very resilient uh, to potential shocks because many of the levers uh, of the economic growth uh, are in the hands of the government or large uh, company that may or may not be state-owned company. So whereby there were to be maybe a weakness is in, in the demand, uh, you mentioned maybe service sector could take some time, maybe savings could grow because there's uncertainty. The government can always plug uh, whatever is uh, missing, and they can do this in a number of ways. For example, investment, uh, uh, investment in technology, I expect these are long-term plans. It's not going to be realized in the second quarter, but investment in, uh, for example, semiconductor industry that uh, uh, may not be so, let's say, uh, announced uh, so widely in the media. It's actually going on uh, beyond the radar screen, and that could provide the growth that could then materialize in the next few quarters. So I'm actually you know, relatively confident that uh, uh, the growth will be there, the quality of the growth is up to the government to decide if this plug uh, is efficient or not, because sometimes plug tend to uh, post a, he- a good headline number, but at the cost of uh, inefficiency. But I do think that there is now a new wave, like we had uh, high-speed rail infrastructure development 10, 15 years ago. Now we have a new wave of technology improvement that maybe at the beginning people would also be reluctant to understand, like we had in the high-speed rail. People were complaining maybe the company lose money. And actually now it has completely transformed the way that the Chinese society operates. And I think that would be also the case for the new technology investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Miguel, you remind me of, uh, maybe that's a case in point, uh, there's a report saying that the Chinese chip makers, uh, they are filling the void uh, of uh, uh, basically, uh, the space created by uh, the U.S. government's ban, you know, for export to the Chinese market by U.S. companies and companies from probably the you know, countries like uh, from from other developed world. Uh, so they are re- regist- registering, you know, uh, massive uh, profits, uh, you know, year on year because they are meeting or they are feeding this uh, strong demand uh, inside the Chinese market. So maybe that's. Uh, I mean, at least partly uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing, that's also something you know, uplifting, uh, optimistic about the, the economy growth. That's uh, uh, what happens uh, when uh, countries uh, uh, try to contain the technological development of other countries by putting export embargo like the U.S. Uh, is doing on semiconductor against China. I've always said that these... Uh, may hurt China in the very, very short term. But of course, the flip side of this is that it just accelerates the Chinese investment into uh, technology. You know, China is very smart. You know, if they can buy uh, products, if they can buy high-tech products from the U.S., from Korea, uh, they will be happy to do it. If Korea and the U.S. and Holland, let's not forget the Netherlands uh, with ASML, if they decide not to sell those products uh, to China, China says, okay, fine, for the time being, we will not have seven, five nanometers semiconductors, but we will invest and we will create our own indigenous system. Also, I think there is a bit of a misunderstanding. This high technology semiconductor, let's say the three and five nanometers, the one that China cannot yet do by themselves, they are not the things that are used for uh, let's say, high technology, military um, applications. Uh, they are done for the iPhone 14 and 15. It's uh, getting smaller and smaller. But uh, So maybe some uh, telecom company could suffer for not having these uh, smaller size uh, microchips. Uh, but that's a completely different story from saying we are containing the development of Chinese uh, technology sector. Because even with higher size uh, uh, semiconductor, uh, China will continue to develop and applicate. Even cars... Uh, uh, electric vehicles, self-driven cars, they don't really need uh, such small semiconductors. So 
I think uh, some countries, U.S. and I think U.S. and sometimes European Union, and I try to tell them they uh, misunderstand that uh, uh, by just uh, forcing a embargo on export. Uh, uh, it's uh, us, uh, European uh, and U.S., uh, who will be losing out because once China catches up uh, in MEST, uh, then it will be on its own. It will need uh, any more products from ASML, from Holland, uh, from uh, Micron Technologies, uh, and the catch up then for the West will be impossible. So the risk is, uh, uh, I'm afraid, uh, more uh, downside uh, on those countries that decide to decouple on uh, uh, supplying technology uh, to China. Because, let's be honest, uh, Technology is a, a unique competitive advantage only for a limited period of time. So then mm-hmm. it, beca- it becomes uh, more of a commodity. So it's impossible to stop forever development of technology, especially you know, China is not uh, a country, a s- small country. It's the second and soon the biggest economy in the world with uh, lots of Chinese uh, engineers that are now returning from the U.S., uh, uh, even uh, cooperation with some Korean engineers. So it is not... Uh, really realistic uh, to uh, slow down China technology development. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, there's a, a silver lining uh, over there because of the tension there. Uh, thank you, uh, Miguel. Uh, so, Chu uh, you know, if you look at the meeting at the end of last month, uh, by a top-level meeting of the party uh, analyzing the current economic situation uh, and the economic work, uh, pointed out that, you know, threefold pressure uh, that uh, haunted China in the past couple of years, including contraction of demand, supply shocks, and weak expectations. Uh, you know, with this uh, data out of this May Day holiday, uh, can we say you know the lack of demand is further alleviated? Um, you know, probably less concerned, less worried about consumption here. Well, I think the both data are telling one story. They're not conflicting with each other. First of all, people are getting their job back with the reopen of the economy. People are getting their paycheck back online. The so people will have the saving, uh, will have the short-term saving and the cash flow. And uh, you know, people go out for fun, enjoy their life. But also, if you want to buy, you know, assets, you restore the bigger confidence. You need to have the savings in your bank account, and you need to have a good expectation for the economy. That requires you can have some solid restoration over your balance sheet in your family. So I think this still the pressure would be there. And also if you take a look at the outside of China, today, just right now, America, one month of the Treasury bond yielding rate is 5.5%. I don't know whether you understand how how amazing, what surprising this number is. That shows there's a huge uncertainty going outside of China. So that, that can be pressure. But also I think uh, I'm confident and uh, optimistic because as we just mentioned about uh, uh, you know, China upgrading its uh, manufacturing, for example, EV, a lot of people are underestimating this issue. Do you still remember when we were using the mobile phone and at first we switched to smartphone? Everybody say, okay, it's just a more beautiful you know, telephone. But actually it means upgrading of the whole value chain and whole industry. Just take a look, how many people are changing their life and having a new job over this new platform? You know, live streaming, performer, influencer, that does not exist 10 years ago, five years ago. And also with EV, it's not just a car, it's more than another you know, business ecology uh, and uh, circle. And also about the chips, and we have already seen the things are happening, for example, in our lab, in the school. Uh, people are using, well, you, we use the Qualcomm's, uh, you know, uh, it's like a less high-ended uh, you know, chips, programmable ones. It's like 10 mil, uh, nanometer or something. So we used to buy them from Qualcomm or Texas Instruments. It's very expensive, and you need to wait you know, like uh, one week or two weeks for the customer service to help you to solve a problem. And now we have to buy it from the local manufacturers. It, it was not as good as the foreign you know, imported. But after one year or two years uh, evolution, now their interface, their quality is really, really good. And you can get their customer service with one second waiting online. This is really comfortable. And you can tell from the numbers of exports from from South Korea, their export to China is dropping dramatically. And most of the dropping happens in the semiconductor sectors. And given more time, I think this trend will be more serious. So I think blocking on the technology is not going to work. And also China is going to create more jobs and have more of the income over this new area. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but but Xu Jiang, uh, are you concerned with uh, you know this? Uh, I'm I'm not sure whether you can call it a trend or not. At least efforts or attempts, uh, you know, by by Washington basically to uh, shifting uh, the supply chain away from China, you know, by near shoring or friend shoring. Uh, what's going on and what's the effect? You know, how will it impact the uh, you know China's position at the center of manufacturing uh, in the world? Oh, I'm not worried. You know, uh, our uh, co-workers actually have been asking this similar question back in the 2018 uh, when Trump just did take the position to, you know, fight against China in the, the trade conflict. I answered the similar, and now I would like to repeat my answer. You know, the real network of international trade are based on the real demand by long-term contract and the frequent and the many times the negotiation on the deals and the you know prices and on the value chain and shipments and all the details and this kind of arrangement would not change easily based on the people's you know uh, political willingness or so mm -hmm. so uh, we've been bonding in this kind of trade network for a very long time you know whether you add 10 percent or 20 percent of the tariff on what's made in china products like t-shirts or lighters or evs people will not change their demand. For example, right now, for the solar panels, America are posing like 240% of the tariff on made in China solar panels. But still, the cooperation is there by shifting away. For example, they're, they're uh, making a, a joint investment. So they're forming American companies, but by using Chinese equipment and technology to produce a solar panel still used in America. So we take a detour to shake hands under the table. That's how the market reacts to the political confrontation or willingness. Mm -hmm. And this well, thing is going to keep on being here for a very, very long time until we walk out of this business downside cycle together. And when we walk again on the upward lag together, America, China, Europe, ASEAN countries, and then I think everything will change and we will cooperate closely again. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, of course, uh, th there are, you know, competition in the manufacturing sector, Hong Hao. Uh, another important driver of economic growth is uh, the housing market. Uh, so it remains kind of uh, low, let's say. You know, what are the reasons? You know, is there a lack of enthusiasm uh, to invest in the property market? Or what are the factors behind this uh, kind of a probably less than expected uh, uh, situation here? Yeah. There are patchy recoveries in the housing sector. I mean, just now I mentioned that, you know, in the first three months, uh, secondary housing uh, property sales has been quite strong. But then uh, the primary uh, property market has somehow sort of lackluster, you know, because people were still concerned about, you know, uh, developers not being able to uh, finish the construction. And therefore, you know, there are unfinished buildings uh, that they can't deliver uh, to, the, to the end buyers. So there are you know issues like that, but then at the same time you know we've seen a very general recovery uh, in the secondhand market uh, in the first three months of the year, and that is telling you that you know people are still enthusiastic about you know uh, improving the uh, living quality and also uh, living space, and therefore you know they're forking out you know a very large chunk of money uh, to buy properties, uh, and also you know from the data we can see that high end property actually could exceedingly well. And that is showing that you know probably higher income earners are not being affected uh, by the pandemic as much, and, and now they're going out to buy houses again. So I think over time, uh, you know, uh, the primary housing market uh, should sort of follow uh, the secondary housing market as well. I think they experienced in two thousand fourteen uh, when we went through a very similar episodes about you know housing recovery. It took about more than three quarters uh, for the housing sector to recover. And I say, you know, because, you know, of a very difficult uh, three years, in the past three years. Uh, so I would say that, you know, this time around, we may need more time uh, for the housing sector to be fully recovered. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the manufacturing activity, uh, this PMI, uh, we also see this official PMI, for example, also slipped from uh, March uh, to April, uh, March 51.9, uh, larger than 50 expansion uh, level, and 49.2 in April actually, you know, it's uh, contracting, let's say. Uh, it, you know, what are the reasons why it's in contracting or simply because there's a high, high uh, level probably in March? 
Yeah, I think it's it's uh, sort of uh, receiving from a very high level. Um, I think it takes more than one month's data to make a trend. Uh, so for now, even though it is sort of surprising, you know, because you know people were hoping for a sort of a gradual recovery, you know, from uh, from the beginning of the year, and we did have it uh, in the first three months of the year. But then, you know, uh, uh, in April, probably it's because of seasonality as well. You know, April tends to be a slower month. Uh, uh, as well, so it, it remains to be seen. But I think all in all, you know, one month's data doesn't make a trend. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Rick, you know, if you look at this high level meeting at the uh, end of last month, of course, it, talk, it mentioned about uh, some uh, new development area probably. It, well, it has been there for quite some time, for example, EVs, artificial intelligence, and so on, mm -hmm. as well as a number of uh, you know, issues such as in you know, the local debts and arrears to entrepreneurs, uh, enterprises. Uh, so what do you see are the priorities for the Chinese government? Or do we expect any new policies to support growth? Uh, I do think that there will be some more uh, policies uh, for growth, both in terms of uh, building some of the companies uh, for future industries. And industries of the future, I mean, ranging from artificial intelligence and related to, uh, to that kind of technology and green energy uh, and fighting climate change. I mean, China is, is the leader in the world uh, on that, from selling electric vehicles to producing the solar panels. So I think the government will try to juice that part of the economy, at the same time trying to deal with some of the harder issues. And I, I do think that the issue of real estate uh, and, 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 and of financial companies uh, and their, the liabilities related to debt uh, is something uh, that the government will have as a very high priority, because that's something China-specific uh, that, 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 that has to be dealt with by the country. The other thing I think the government will be watching is the global issues, uh, what's, what's happening uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and global inflation as a result of that. Also, uh, the uh, geopolitical risks as a result of, uh, of that war and, uh, and international tensions. And the government will try to figure out, uh, does it need to, to uh, just remain alert, or does it need to take uh, proactive uh, measures uh, to deal with some of, the, some, some of these tensions and risks? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Rick, at the same time, we do see, you know, despite uh, the, the efforts, whatever you call it, you know, decoupling or de-risking yeah. uh, in the, the US and the, the EU, uh, but, uh, you know, the economies are closely linked. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if there is a slow growth or even recession, for example, in the U.S. economy, as people fear, uh, that, of course, will have an impact on the Chinese exports, for example. Right. Uh, so that will be probably, uh, you know, remains a challenge for the time to come. Exactly. That's, that's why I, I do think that it's in the interest of the government of China to reduce the geopolitical risk. And really, the, the best thing that the Chinese government could do for the Chinese economy right now uh, is try to bring an end to the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, because that, that would really help the global economy. And, and, and that's good for Chinese manufacturing. Um, I, but, but, but beyond that, it's very true uh, that, that if, if, if there's a pullback, if, if the high interest rates in the West uh, and the, the central bank's actions to tighten uh, cause recession, uh, that's bad for the Western countries, but it's bad for China, too, because of the manufacturing sector. So, so I, I do think that uh, the government has to be alert to what's happening, but also try to be uh, proactive in ways that it can uh, to, uh, to reduce, the, reduce the risk to the Chinese economy of these, these uh, global problems. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, peace and stability, the foundation for more yeah. economic uh, growth. With that, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qianduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.